Stephen, before the break, we were talking about um, the almost cynical approach, um, short-term approach of trying to fill a vacuum in an attempt to lodge or dislodge President Jacob Zuma from, from the, the, the position that he's in. Embarrassing President Zuma is one thing, dislodging him from the ANC quite another. Um, in your mind, what is the the kind of advantage, um, if any, that Mr. Zuma at, 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 at the current moment holds in the African National Congress that puts him a little bit ahead of, uh, you know, several pretenders to the throne? Well, I think Mr. Zuma benefits for a start the way, from the way in which the factional politics in the ANC are playing out. Um, I mean, what is happening here is that you have broadly two factions. I mean, there's a lot else going on. There's this nationalist faction that I'm talking about and a very loose coalition that's, that's opposing them. Um, now, neither of those factions are, are necessarily wildly enthusiastic supporters of Mr. Zuma. Uh, but both of those factions know that on their own they can't beat them. I mean, the most obvious candidate of the nationalist faction is Mr. Sikhwane. Uh, he can't beat Mr. Zuma. I mean, that is, that is simply a political reality. Uh, so therefore, the obvious advantage Mr. Zuma has got is that the other side don't have a candidate. Well, as we know, there's a plan B. The plan B is that uh, there is uh, Mr. Motlante, who's the deputy president, who is not a member of either of the factions, uh, but who conceivably could beat Mr. Zuma. So there's a great deal of tub thumping and a great deal of, of, of uh, leaking to the media in a an attempt to create the impression that Mr. Mutlante is a candidate. At this stage, we don't know whether Mr. Mutlante is a candidate. I suspect the reason we don't know is that he doesn't know because he's waiting to see what happens. He's waiting to see which way the wind blows. So it's absolutely conceivable that we get to October or November and discover that uh, there isn't even a, a, an opposition candidate. If there is an opposition candidate, uh, Mr. Zuma's uh, advantage is the fact uh, that he's had time to solidly line up his supporters. I mean, everybody on his side knows exactly exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, the other side uh, have been getting a lot of mixed messages. It's not quite clear uh, you know, who's, what people are supposed to do, etc. So, so he has quite a few advantages, even if, which is the only, in my view, the only way he could lose, even if uh, Khalema Mutlante stands against him. Now, obviously, Mr. Mutlante has a very interesting history, um, particularly if one locates it within the current crisis of Marikana. He is a former General Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers. Um, the thing that struck me when Mr. Malema was making this comment about um, workers having to abandon NUM to form another union, um, I was wondering what um, advisors to Mr. Mutlante was thinking when Mr. Malema was making those comments. Surely the, the utterances of Mr. Malema was hurting Mr. Mr. Mutlante's chances if he's indeed considering challenging Mr. Zuma. Well, they may not. They may be neutral to it. I'm sure that he's very uncomfortable with it. I mean, just as, a, as, 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 as something in brackets, every single Secretary General of the ANC since 1990 has been somebody who was previously General Secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers. Uh, so it's become, including the present one, Mr. Mantash, of course. So really, the, the relationship between the National Union of Mine Workers and the ANC is, 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 is a very close one. Uh, and obviously, it, it, it breaks all sorts of rules in ANC etiquette. I certainly think, as I said before, I think it damages Julius Malema. I think it damages the people around him. Uh, the question of what Mr. Mutlante will do and what his relationship to, to, to the presidential race has been will be settled by all sorts of political calculations within the ANC. So it may not affect it either way, uh, but certainly uh, an expelled Youth League president who, who tries to demolish the National Union mine workers uh, is, is, is not on the road to success. Mm -hmm. I think we can assume that. Now, the National Union of Mine Workers have come under considerable pressure um, and criticism um, for the fact that it has created um, social distance or it has allowed social distance between itself and particularly lower end workers in the mining sector. Allegations about fat cat unionists uh, driving around in expensive cars being in collusion with, with the bosses. Do you think, uh, uh, Stephen, that that is a fair criticism toward um, uh, the National Union of Mine Workers, considering um, the the history of the struggle of black miners in South Africa and the centrality of NUM. Have they lost the plot? Well, I don't think it's a case of them losing a plot. I think it's precisely, as you say, a case of putting this in context and putting this in history. And I think there are two things which really haven't featured in this debate which make it more complicated. The first one is the history of trade unionism on the mines itself. The mines were different from every other industry in this country. At the time unions were formed on the mines, it was illegal to actually go onto mine property. 
Uh, yes, in 1946, in different circumstances, uh, people had gone in the dead, dead of the night and formed the African Mine Workers Union. But in this particular occasion, the stakes were high. The decision was made by Cyril Ramaphosa at that stage uh, that what they would do is they would negotiate for recognition from the mines first. The result of that is that they didn't have to go through what every other trade union in this country has gone through, which is a battle for recognition. And if you go through a battle for recognition, you serve link, you, you, you create links between the leaders and the members, uh, which it's very difficult to dismantle because patterns are created. Nung never had that. That's just the result of the circumstances. They've had to invent those as they go along. And it's one of the reasons why relationships between the leaders of NUM and the members of NUM have always been more difficult than they are in other reasons, re in other unions, sorry. The other factor, which we're seeing in some of the reports which is coming out, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, life is always a picnic in manufacturing industry and in commerce, but certainly the conditions under which mine workers work uh, and the conditions under which mine workers live live are extraordinarily different from, from that of many other people in the industry. And that makes it more difficult. Uh, I mean, to give you an example, I remember a time in which civic leaders in, in Alexandra Township, who had very strong roots with their constituency, couldn't get into the shack areas at all. The Marikana La miners are living in shack areas. There's a whole different dynamic which goes on there. So I think it's certainly a wake-up call to the NUM. I think that there are challenges there that they haven't dealt with. But certainly this idea that it's just a bunch of fat cat unionists who don't care about their members, uh, make something quite serious into a trivial issue and it shouldn't be trivialized. Now, of course, the new kid on the block is AMCO. Now, AMCO is not the first uh, mining union that is trying to elbow its way into, um, you know, the, the, the mining industry. We've had mouthpiece before. We've had other unions that have kind of come and gone and, and in a way almost seen as fly-by-night unions. The one thing that has characterized AMCO, though, is wildcat strikes that often leads to loss of life and loss of life of other workers, particularly workers who do not agree with what AMCO is doing. Um, who is AMCO? Um, what are they about? And are they likely to last, um, you know, as a serious player within this industry? Well, AMCO are a breakaway union. Uh, they are formed by uh, Mr. Matunjwa, uh, Jeffrey Matunjwa, who was in the NUM, who was expelled from the NUM by Gwede Mantash when he was General Secretary, now Secretary General of the ANC. Uh, it was, uh, this was in 1998. He's been out of the union for 14 years. Uh, he's been battling to make a break through since then, uh, formed a breakaway union, it didn't really make much headway. And, uh, you know, right now, because of the particular circumstances in the platinum industry, which are very difficult circumstances for NUM, and because of the fact that NUM has found it more difficult over the last while or so to, 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 to maintain links with its members, he has taken advantage of that and his union has taken advantage of that. As you correctly say, it's not only that this is the first, uh, uh, not new on the mines, it's not new in South African industry and in South African trade unionism. Break Breakaway unions are actually quite common. The real test of a breakaway union is whether it can actually get organized enough and build up organized links with its members enough to offer them benefits in the long term. Obviously, this is early stages, but from the evidence we've seen in front of us, uh, a trade union where every time it goes on strike, there are reports of violence, uh, where there seems to be a sort of direct correlation between what the trade union does and, 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 and loss of life between workers. That doesn't sound like a particularly sound footing. So one of two things are going to happen with AMCO, quite frankly. Either it's going to have to change the way it's operating and it's going to become a lot more like the NUM uh, than it is now, uh, or it's going to disappear. Because uh, no matter what happens during strikes, uh, workers are not stupid. Work workers look at this after a while and they say, look, I'm not getting anything out of it. Let me go back to the union where I was getting something. Mm -hmm. Now let's bring it back to, to the, the battle for leadership in the African National Congress and extend it a little bit to, of course, the other partner of that alliance, which is COSATU. COSATU goes to its elective conference in September. Uh, Zuelan Zima Vavi is a very long-serving uh, general secretary of COSATU, incidentally also hailing from the National Union of Mine Correct. Workers. He seems to be, um, in fact, quite muted in this entire process. He's come out, um, you know, very late speaking about the kind of opportunism, uh, whilst not necessarily referring to Mr. Malema in name, but referring to to the phenomena of broke, you know, breakaway trade unions, the fact that when workers fight, bosses um, advance itself. To what extent will the Marikana incident and the fact that numerous come under pressure 
uh, and we know that Numa is not happy with Mr. Vavi's performance. To what extent is this going to impact on his ability to retain his position as General Secretary of the Congress of South African Trade Unions come this, uh, September? I think it's a very interesting dynamic which is playing out there. I mean, the story before Marikana was that uh, the, the, the National Union of Mine Workers, very sympathetic to Mr. Zuma, wants him re-elected, very close to the president of Kosaitu, Struma Dlamini, uh, and Mr. Vavi working with uh, Ivan Jim, who's general secretary of the, the metal workers, uh, trying, feeling that Kosaitu moves to need, needs to move leftwards, Mr. Zuma's a problem, and, and hinting that another, another leadership would be a good idea. When Marikana happens, the story which is told among some people, particularly some people on the left, uh, is that uh, Nung used violence in order to uh, deal with this threat because uh, it's worried about Mr. Vavi and it's worried about its position within Kusatu. Certainly as far as NUM is concerned, what, whatever it may have done right or wrong, uh, I think this has actually strengthened Norm within Kosatu because it's placed Mr. Vavi, and quite properly because he's the Secretary General of Kosatu, uh, he's had to come out very clearly and say, look, we're against breakaway unions, this is a problem. In effect, he's supporting the National Union of Mine Workers and he's supporting the transport workers who are subject to the same sort of pressure. So in effect, it's, bro it's, it's, it's uh, solidified people within Kusatu, uh, they've closed ranks to a certain extent. Uh, does this mean that behind the scenes Num will be working to replace Mr. Vivi? I think probably not. I think it may well mute that. I'm not saying that there's been talk of a challenge to him. Uh, I think we may well see a situation where the effect of Marikana and, and you know, we're only less than a month away from the Kusatu conference, uh, will actually be to, to, to solidify Kusatu, to close ranks within Kusatu. Given the fact that there's this um, obsession to see every political act in South Africa through the prism of succession, as if it's an inevitable consequence that we will have new leadership, if we look at the South African Communist Party, leadership was retained. Um, would status quo be an inappropriate word to use to characterize the three leadership um, you know, conferences, um, given the fact that the party's already had its uh, one, but Kusato and the ANC? Could you see that we retain the leadership quos in Kusatu and, and in fact in the ANC? No, it's highly possible. It's highly possible. Kusatu, it's likely. Look, there may be a challenge to, to Mr. Vavi, but he's still the favourite by a long way. Uh, I don't think there's momentum to replace Rumo Dlamini. Uh, so, yes, uh, you may well have that. As I say, Jacob Zuma may well uh, retain his position. Uh, so, yes, uh, some of us predicted that at the beginning of the year we would have all sorts of sound and fury and end up with exactly what we had at the beginning of the year. Uh, and that's still a very real possibility.